everyone, Dennis Chang here. It's been a while since I made a video because I've been a little bit lazy, but I figured I might as well try to do something. So I don't have anything planned, but we'll see where this uh, video goes. I just spent two months in Europe recording lots of amazing, amazing musicians off the top of my head. There was a great Italian guitar player, Alessio Menconi, one of the best jazz guitar players in the world, bebop players um, from the Netherlands, Martijn van Eterson. Uh, one of the most famous jazz guitar, modern jazz guitar players in the world, Sylvain Luc. Um, you'll find all that good stuff on DC Music School soon. Uh, we're about to release the Sylvain Luc, Le Sylvain Luc lessons quite soon. The Martijn from Ederson lessons are available now. Anyway, check out DC Music School, the link in the description box. Furthermore, if you're into gypsy jazz or bebop, you can check out some of my Sound Slice courses, which um, where I've done courses on developing bebop language from kind of a historical perspective. There's a course on harmony, again, from a historical perspective. And, um, and some beginner gypsy jazz lessons as well, if you're into that stuff. <laughs> I don't have Patreon or anything like that, so if you want to show your support, if you like these videos, that's one way you can show, show your support. Of course, please don't forget to like, subscribe, or even comment if you can. So today's topic, well, I don't have anything planned, but I thought I talk about something that I've been thinking about lately, which is improvisation, how to teach improvisation, how to start um, to learn improvisation when you're kind of just starting out. Obviously, this is not for those of you who are much more advanced. I've been thinking about this because I'm coming from, well, different places. First of all, like uh, a few months ago, I did a workshop in Taiwan where I taught some beginners. And after the workshop, one of the other teachers walked up to me and said, wow, I've never seen such a system before. Like, uh, this, I didn't, I didn't, this is your system, huh? But the thing is, I don't have a system. But I have many, many, many years of experience, many, many years of uh, listening to music, not just casually listening, but listening very, very attentively and with a very analytical mind. I've transcribed or supervised the transcriptions of well over a thousand jazz solos. It's insane. But I've done this. And so I have a huge baggage with me. And then my system is to, um, how do I say? My system is kind of to adapt to what I think the students should be working on based on what they're able to do, their, their learning capacity, their, their current level. So it's, it's, it's very complicated because I don't believe there's like a one size fit all solution. So when it comes to learning jazz guitar or jazz music in general, one thing you rarely hear would be don't practice improvisation. And I want to talk about this. It's a very, bit of a complicated topic. So I want to go back to that story about this workshop that I did a few months ago where I was invited to teach some beginners. And I always ask beginners, people that I meet for the first time, why are you here? Um, do you like jazz? And everyone says, yeah. Well, what do you like about jazz? I don't know. I like it. It's cool. Yeah, but like, who's your idol? Uh, and it's just like random names. They'll say like, well, whatever, Chet Baker, wasn't longer. All right, what's your favorite recording? I don't know. Like, it's all very, very general statements. And these general statements are very, very revealing. It tells me that, okay, they like it just the same way that I like to read, but I don't read a lot. <laughs> um, I like movies, but I'm not super knowledgeable of movies. It's just very, very casual like. As opposed to me, when I first discovered uh, Django Reinhardt, it was, became a passion, an obsession even. And that's 
the first step in being able to learn effectively is to know exactly what you like about the music and when you know what you like you're gonna it's the what you should practice becomes so much easier because there's a path available to you for me i want to play in the style of django reinhardt not only in the style of django reinhardt, i would go see some friends play all the time every week and they'd play like songs like jersey bounce minor swing all of me i made notes of all those songs i learned those songs i listened to recordings and then i realized oh man it's hard to understand what django was doing i couldn't quite understand what he was doing in his improvisations and then I discovered Jimmy Rosenberg and Stokola Rosenberg was more virtuosic, but then the lines made more sense. So then I started by copying them, not playing as fast as they did, but copying the lines. And so what to practice was very, very clear from the get-go. Whereas when you give this like very blanket general statement like, oh, I like jazz, I like uh, Chet Baker. Well, what do you like about Chet? Uh, I don't know. So this is, when, when it's vague like that, you don't know what you should practice. So coming back to this beginner, I'd be like, okay, um, I see that you kind of practice a bit of your scales, a bit of your arpeggios, you kind of know your chords, but you don't know any songs. That's already a, a major problem. And you're working on this song and I see you're struggling a lot over it, even though you kind of know your scales and arpeggios. It doesn't really sound like much. I didn't say it like that. And so I tell the student, all right, instead of like working on improvisation, why don't we try to work on vocabulary, building vocabulary? Do you like bebop? And if they say yes, or if they don't even know what it is, then it's a lot harder. Because as I said, I'm just gonna keep going back to the story of Django Reinhardt. Um, when it comes to something that you really love, that you're passionate about, it is much easier to learn than forcing yourself to do what someone tells you to do because they tell you it's good for you. I don't know if that makes sense. If I tell someone to practice bebop lines, but they don't like those lines, then I think they're not worth practicing, honestly. Um, but if you do like those lines, then great. That, that's a great way to start. So, you know, I would show them a few phrases over uh, standard chord progressions. When we, we, we took a song, we took Lady Bird. That was the song that the, the teacher assigned to them for whatever reason. I was like, okay, well, here's a phrase that works over C. Here's a phrase that works over F minor. And I explained, all right, F minor, B flat seven, same, same chord, blah, blah, blah. So I showed a whole bunch of lines. Actually, I didn't. I showed only one line, one or two. And I showed them how you could use the same line over different chords. So in the case of Lady Bird, you have C major. I showed something like. And after the F minor chord, go back to C. Then B flat, 2, 5 to A flat, the same. And after have A minor C. And after D minor to G. Something really, really simple, just to get this, just this sound into their ears. So this, over C major. And then after F minor. Etc. Etc. And then I try to show them how to slowly come up with little variations. So that's what we did. We worked on vocabulary because I heard them play, and when they played their scales, they were struggling finding the notes and like not only finding the notes, they were getting lost in the song. And when you just work on something very simple like this, it already sounds good. Of course, this is not a good solo. Just doing. It's a very stupid solo, right? But it's kind of like a toddler when they first begin to speak. They have extremely, extremely limited vocabulary. Uh, and so this was the system that I came up with on the spot for that particular student because they couldn't tell me what they liked. And if they can't tell me what they liked, the only thing I can do is suggest things. And I saw that with the scales and arpeggios that they knew, they were still struggling really hard. But then, okay, I showed these, uh, this one phrase, one or two phrases, and I, I saw that they were, it was much easier, much easier to digest. So this is what I mean 
in the beginning, don't necessarily work on pure improvisation. This is something that music schools will tell you, oh, you have to be creative, you have to do this. But you don't tell a toddler to be, uh, how do you say, you don't expect a toddler to be fluent in their mother tongue right away. They always start with very, very limited vocabulary. But as time progresses, they're going to expand their vocabulary and then through environment, they're going to develop their own speaking style. And I think jazz improvisation, at least bebop, uh, is the same thing. Coming back to this idea, this conventional wisdom where teachers are saying, oh, you shouldn't like prepare anything, you should always be making stuff up on the spot. So coming back to that story of me having transcribed or investigated a lot of players like really attentively, I can tell you that those guys, those musicians, worked out certain things to a certain extent. Wes Montgomery, Charlie Parker, Charlie Christian, even Django Reinhardt. And by working a lot on vocabulary, um, your ear begin, begin to uh, hear how they work after a bit of time. And then you'll be able to make sense of how to use some of those arpeggios or scales that you learned and create variations on said vocabulary. For example, if you listen to Charlie Parker, he has a lot of uh, lines that he repeats all over, like, um, let's say over B flat seven. Typical Charlie Parker line. Or F minor seven, or F minor seven, B flat seven. Very typical. Um, if you listen to him playing over rhythm changes in B flat, he plays this line so many times. This is over the last four bars of the rhythm changes. You'll play something like that or variations of that. So like it'd be There is so much repetition in a lot of these players playing. And you check out Giant Steps by uh, John Coltrane. Again, I mean, there, it, people know the story. He worked on it. There's so much repetition in the playing. So it goes against what some teachers will say. Oh, don't practice vocabulary. Don't practice licks. You just got to come out like out of nowhere. Just cut from your pure talent. And... Um, I don't agree with that. Again, it depends on the style you're going for, but we're talking about like bebop here. So what basically, what this means is that a huge chunk of your practice time should be dedicated to uh, listening, but not listening casually, but listening intelligently, maybe with your instrument. Definitely with your instrument in the beginning if your ears are not so refined and you listen and then you have to figure out what you like. Is it a song? Let's say you're working on Autumn Leaves. Then you're going to check out different versions of Autumn Leaves, preferably from a player that you really like. And then you're going to listen with your instrument in hand, and then you're going to um, try to see, like, as you hear a phrase. And then you're going to stop the recording, and you're going to lift that phrase on your instrument and try to see how it fits over the chord progression. And then that's the process of developing vocabulary. So you need to be learning songs, um, and you need to be... Um, listening to players that you really like. I don't think you necessarily have to transcribe entire solos. And you can just take bits and pieces of things that you like. In fact, there are some people who say they've never transcribed. All they did was listen. Okay, this is where I said that everyone learns in a different way. Some people have, are blessed with really, really amazing ears from the get-go. And here's a kind of a rhetorical question. Let's say um, w one example of someone who didn't really transcribe is my friend Rocky Gresset, uh, a jazz guitar player in Paris, plays gypsy jazz in some West Montgomery style electric guitar. And he says he's never really transcribed. But you hear that he plays a lot of West Montgomery ideas. If he's never transcribed, then how can he execute these West Montgomery lines? And here comes that rhetorical question. Let's say um, Jingle Bells, all right? Uh, I've, I don't have it on sheet music, but it's something that I've heard my entire life. Hopefully you've heard it too. Let's say we do it in the key of C.
I pull this out of thin air, air from my ears, from my memory. But isn't that kind of the same thing as transcribing? Delayed transcribing? So what Rocky means, and a lot of players like that, they never sat down and like copied directly, but they listen so much, so much, so much, so much that it's in their ears that they can reproduce some of those ideas, those West Montgomery ideas. <laughs> etc etc so in some ways even though they say they never transcribed they have transcribed <laughs> so maybe transcribing isn't the word we should use listening very like attentive listening it's like immerse yourself in the music so much that you hear it in your head and then when you grab your instrument you take the time to figure it out which leads to the next step which is the concept of um, muscle memory which is a very very important thing um it's not enough to be able to hear something then you want to be able to translate it to instrument and be able to execute it because when you're actually improvising quote unquote improvising you don't have a lot of time to think you have to hear what you hear in your head and then you have to be able to execute it and then in able to in order to be able to execute it you will have to have practiced something quite a few times especially if, some, if it's something more intricate. Okay, if it's easier, then maybe it's okay. But I cannot imagine anyone being able to pull something like this without ever having tried it before. All right, so what I just played there, I cannot imagine anyone who, who says, um, yeah, don't work on vocabulary. I cannot imagine such people ever playing such lines. Maybe they don't want to, which is fair enough. But yeah, I, I, I met, I've met a lot of people who, who say such things. And when I listen to them play, their playing is based on scales, modes, and arpeggios, which to me has very little to do with bebop. And again, maybe they don't want to play bebop, they want to play the thing, but it's, it's not interesting for me. And okay, they say that everything should be made up on the spot, but I, I guarantee you, even such players have patterns that they've repeated based on whatever they practice, their scales, their arpeggios, and whatnot. Like this line that I played. Is that what I played? I don't remember, sorry. <laughs> but um, it's theoretically not very complicated, but to be able to execute that at that speed requires a lot, a lot, a lot of practice. So, it is not enough to just listen carefully. You have to practice. And it's just like a language. So many of you know that I'm uh, studying Japanese quite intensively these days. And there are certain sentences that I've been practicing like every day while I'm at the gym, when I'm out walking, uh, taking a shower. I'm training my muscles, my mouth, to be able to say a series of words that form a, a more complex sentence. One of these sentences was, And that was very, very hard for me. Uh, just like four weeks ago, I'll be like, and just that and just that for like I must have repeated that sentence for like two three weeks before I could say it fairly easily because if you don't practice this 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 habit of being able to say such words when you actually have to use that sentence, you'll be like, Machiash te fumble, because this is muscle memory. It's not enough that you have the sentence in your head, you have to practice. That's why great speakers aren't necessarily born great speakers. They're, they're, they become great speakers because they've been doing it for so long and um, they've developed the habit of being able to speak with such um, fluency. 
the one Japanese sentence I'm working right now <laughs> is Sumimasen, Saki, Haitan Deskedo, Wasurmono Ste, Detta no de, Suika ga tsukai nakanate shimai mashita. That was really, really hard. I'd be like, Sumimasen, Saki, Haitan Deskedo, Wasurmono Ste, Detta no de, Suika ga tsukai nakanate. Wait, practice this every day um, for, for weeks before I was able to say this. It is the exact same thing on the guitar. You cannot be thinking too much. It has to be uh, as automatic as possible. Now, some people are more talented than others, but it's okay. I believe that even if you're not as talented as someone who is really talented, anyone can reach a decent level. It just requires hard work. But okay, some talented people will be able to progress a lot faster, but you shouldn't compare yourself to them if you're not like that. It's okay. What I mean to say is that there are some people who are able to improvise almost right away. Some people have to spend more time developing vocabulary, shedding, working out the muscle memory thing. It's, it's, it can be a long process, but not as long as one might think. And that's why when I was doing that workshop with those beginners, okay, they learned, they, they kind of memorized their scales. Um, they had not memorized the song that the teacher assigned to them. They had to look at the chart. So imagine this. They were assigned a song that they haven't memorized. They haven't really played the chords to it. So they're looking at the chart. Okay, C major, C Ionian, oh, C Ionian, oh, uh, F minor, uh, F Dorian. Uh. Too much thinking. What I did was, okay, C major, you know, let's minimize the thinking. C major. What was the phrase I showed them? Whatever, something like that, let's say. That's all you have to think. So then let's play it very slowly. And let's do it out of time. C major. F minor. Or even down here. Etc. etc. So for people who learn at a slower pace, it's better to simplify certain things so that you minimize the amount of thinking that you have to do. And when it gets comfortable, then okay, you can try to tackle more, tackle more, tackle more. And this is often one of the big um, obstacles for a lot of beginners because, and I, I would say this is the fault of the teachers as well, um, trying to just impose one system. All right, just improvise from the go. Why can't you do it? This person can do it. Why can't you? Well, no, everyone learns in a different place. But I guarantee you, we can all reach the same, let's say, decent level. I listen to a lot of West Montgomery as well. And... Man, I'm very, very, very convinced that he had a lot of things, like even huge chunks of songs worked out. Like, uh, I'm definitely like an, on the song with Thumb. At one point he does this thing. He could not have improvised that. It's worked out he's he worked out i mean it's based on some big band horn arrangement i think maybe from count basie even maybe someone who knows can tell me but um throughout a lot of recordings there are all these things that he does that i am convinced uh is worked out ahead of time and then he shed shed them so that it's part of his muscle memory um same thing with uh, charlie parker and even someone like django reinhardt um, he recorded the song I'm Confessing twice in the 30s or maybe even more. There's, record, there's a version from 1934 and I believe uh, a version from 1935. Both versions he plays the exact same lick over the D7 chord. So it proves that of course he's a genius but there's a lot, a lot of effort behind this genius. There's a lot of things that they practiced, worked out, 
even patterns. Like in 1935, if you listen to series recordings, um, you see from, sorry, from period to period in, in Django's career, let's say like a reign within a certain range, like let's say from 1933 to 1935, you hear, if you listen to a lot of Django's improvisations, you can hear certain lines that he repeats a lot. But here's the thing. These guys are such geniuses that they are able to turn lines also into their tiniest cellular fragments. I call these uh, melodic cells. So this is where we get into the topic of quote-unquote real improvisation. You'll have to practice to a certain point where you're able to understand a long line and deconstruct it to its most basic component. So let's take uh, that line that I played earlier. Actually, I don't remember how I played it, but I think it was something like this. Let's just say it was that. Let's deconstruct this. Well, first of all, let's say it's over an A minor chord to D7, then to G, which is A minor D7. So, do, 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 de. Okay, this is, that's one little fragment. It's an arpeggio, it's a C major 7 arpeggio. Okay, so then this is where having practiced arpeggios can come in handy. So I took a little fragment and I played around with it. Let's look at the next fragment. Okay. Over the D7 sounds good. So you're just playing over, uh, let's say you're playing over D7. Cool. Let's look at the next fragment. Oh, cool. Typical phrase from the, the early 30s era, the Louis Armstrong era. What else do we have? Okay, let's just take this. Uh, just this. What else we have? Okay. Can we deconstruct this even more? Uh, just change the finger. What else do we have? If you're able to do this, which again, depending on your ability to absorb things, can come sooner or later. But again, don't worry if you're not able to do this right away. Just let it come naturally, don't get frustrated. Don't worry if someone is able to do this faster than you can, doesn't matter. But if you keep working on these complex lines, this, these intricate lines, um, you'll develop muscle memory, you'll develop your ears, and then hopefully eventually you'll be able to just deconstruct everything. And this is when the real fun begins, when you can really improvise for real. And that's how it was for me in the beginning. I remember when I was learning this uh, Django Reinhardt style, gypsy jazz, whatever you want to call it, I couldn't understand what Django was doing because even though Django was using um, certain ideas that he obviously practiced, he was able to manipulate them because he understood them very deeply at the most molecular level. But then I started listening to like Stokola, Rosenberg, Jimmy Rosenberg. In those days, they played these long solos that were kind of prepared, so to speak, or like they had these long lines that would work over particular chords or chord progressions. And that was much easier. So that's how I started actually. And even in the beginning, what I did is I didn't always copy them exactly. I might have changed one thing or two just to make it easier for me to process. And I encourage you to do this. Like you don't have to be an exact clone of who you like. You can always change things. And then, you know, I did this for a while 
And then I started just naturally being able to come up with these variations. And now I have a whole lot more freedom than I used to when I started. And every year I get better and better even at my advanced age. So this is me telling you there's no shame in uh, working out things. Uh, there's no shame in copying others. Okay, as an artist, it's true. Maybe you don't want to do this for the rest of your life. But here's the thing. If you practice things that you like rather than what people tell you to practice, like you should study uh, Miles Davis because that's what everyone studies. But if you don't like Miles Davis, then it's, it's going to be hard to, to absorb things. But if you practice what you like, you're going to probably like something, let's say, from Chet Baker, maybe from Red Garland, maybe from West Montgomery. And from studying these three players, you're going to come up with your own soup and your own style. Uh, and it's a whole lot more fun, I tell you. The beginning of this video, you heard me play one chorus over a lullaby of Birdland. And um, it's improvised, but it, there's a lot of manipulation of, uh, of, of uh, lines, not lines, but manipulation of uh, melodic cells that I chained together. And at one point, I did this thing here. I don't know where I got this, but it's something I heard somewhere at some point. It's kind of like Hoki Gresset saying that he's never transcribed. So it's not something that I transcribed, but it's something that I heard in my ear over this. So um, the importance of attentive listening uh, cannot be stressed enough. It is so important. And then towards the end, there was something that I got from uh, Rocky Gressa actually, because I was recording him in December, and he, over certain chord progressions, I heard like over one, six, two, five, he liked to do. And then, I mean, I didn't, I didn't transcribe him doing this because when we were recording him, he like he was using this figure so many times across so many different songs. It, it was just in my ear. So I think it sounds great. Then I think I ended the solo with this. So, which is a Django thing, something that I practiced a long time ago. Sorry. So this is for those of you who are beginners and are like stressing out because you're not able to come up with great improvisations even though you've been working on your scales and arpeggios for maybe a few years and you're still not getting anywhere. I think the missing thing is exactly what I was talking about. Uh, muscle memory, listening, and um, developing vocabulary. Before I end this video though, I want to share a story about uh, Sylvain Luc. Those who don't, who don't know him, he's, he's a genius. He's unbelievable, like Birelli Legrand, but in a different way, with a different style. Um, I, I had a lot of quite deep philosophical, philosophical conversations with him outside of work. A really nice guy. And we talked about how he thinks, how he perceives me. So he says that, oh no, I, don't, I try not to play licks or uh, everything I do is improvised in the moment. And it is true, but again, this is a matter of semantics. When, when someone says something like that, it can be a little bit dangerous to certain beginners who, who are going to feel overwhelmed, oh, maybe I shouldn't work on this, I need to be original. But let me tell you, in Sylvain Luc's playing, there's also a lot of repetition. Just like when Rocky said he's never transcribed, but he can play all these West Montgomery, well, again, it's not him sitting down with a West Montgomery record and lifting each line. It's him having listened to West Montgomery every single day for many hours, for many years, and then suddenly being able to hear, right? Things like that. Because I guarantee you that they practiced a lot. And uh, Sylvain Luc, he was... Um, playing a lot of dance music, uh, folk music, or 
with his brothers since a very, very early age. His older brothers were musicians, and he had an orchestra where they had to play music for people to dance to. So he was developing vocabulary from a very early age. He was listening to a lot of music, maybe not transcribing directly, but absorbing, absorbing, absorbing music, and then trying certain ideas out. And that's where his patterns, his muscle memory comes from. Because if you check out his solos, that on the, the DC Music School lessons that we're about to release, you're going to see there are some repeated patterns. It didn't come out of nowhere. <laughs> ah, jazz joke. So it's a question of semantics, but I guarantee all these players, there's um, muscle memory in there. That muscle memory may have come in a subconscious way for them, as opposed to me telling you maybe you should do it in a deliberate way sit down with a with your guitar or whatever instrument you play put on a recording work out the line slowly and just practice it for them it came in a more subconscious and natural way but they still have gone through the same process <laughs> And that's the same thing with my technique. A lot of people ask me, wow, Dennis, how can you play like fast and everything? And I tell them, actually, I never worked on technique. And it's, it's true. But what I did work on were lines. I worked on a lot of lines, being able to play them up to a certain speed. And my technique comes purely from that. So I hope this video was useful to you. I just want to give you guys another perspective, another way of thinking about learning that people, may, teachers may not uh, teach, that may not be a popular opinion. If it's good enough for people like Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, Django Reinhardt, Wes Montgomery, it's good enough for me.